uh, uniforms and they'll be packing heat and they'll say, you know, come with me and if you don't, they'll grab you. And they keep cameras all over the place. And as a result, it's pretty safe there. Not perfectly safe, but pretty safe. Why? Because God forbid a rape or a murder occurs there, they're going to lose big bucks and they really don't want that to happen. Whereas in my city of New Orleans, there's this park, Audubon Park, similar to Stanley Park in Vancouver, gigantic big park, and it's very dangerous. You don't go there at night. Because, or one of the reasons, is because the people in charge of that don't lose money if a murder or a rape occurs in Audubon Park or on the streets. Whereas in the malls, which are private streets, in the big malls, like the Edmonton Mall is a gigantic city. It's got private streets in it. You're very safe there because they have an incentive to make sure that you're safe. So, the, you know, Elm Street would be now privately owned by the Elm Street Corporation, and the Elm Street Corporation would have cops or cameras or whatever they thought. And if they didn't do it right, they would lose money because the housing prices will go down, there's too much crime on Elm Street. And Maple Street next door, which is one much better, those people would be able to buy out the Elm Street because the Elm Street prices would fall, the Maple Street prices would rise, they'd be richer. The property that's mishandled would go into a better hand. In other words, it would work just like peanut butter or cough drops or pens. The reason peanut butter, cough drops, and pens are pretty good, there's no crisis with regard to them, is because if you're not giving a good peanut butter or a pen, you'll go broke. And the other people will, will uh, supersede you. How about the role of insurance companies? Well, why don't I call on people who haven't had a turn, okay. and then sure. we'll get to other people who, uh, second time around after all the okay. first these. You want to go? Oh, sure. Uh, to property rights now. I saw in another video that you did that you don't believe in intellectual pro property rights, but actual pro property rights? Like, don't you think something like that would, like, uh, I guess, reduce motivation for innovation? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, patents and copyright. Yeah, you mean that's right. talking about. Those are the biggies there. Uh, here I recommend a friend of mine, Stefan Kinsella, who had a magnificent article. I forget the title of it, something like intellectual property rights think, or anti-intellectual property rights. It was in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Just look under Kinsella IP for intellectual property and you can dig it out of the Google. And what he said is that if I, if someone grabs my attache case, he has it and I don't have it anymore, and the whole idea, or one of the ideas of property rights is to figure out who can deal with which property. Is this my cow or your cow? Well, if I have the cow, you can't have it. You have it, I can't have it. But with intellectual property or with knowledge, the fact that you have it doesn't mean that I can't have it. Suppose girl one puts her hair up in a ponytail. And girl two sees it and says, whoa, that's a great idea. I'll put my hair up in a ponytail. Did girl two steal anything from girl one? Did she go over to girl one and mess up her hair and say, no, no, you can't have a ponytail. I'm having the, the ponytail. No. Girl two is not guilty of any crime. Girl one still has a ponytail. Girl two can have a ponytail. Namely, it can't be property unless it's scarce. And once the thing is known, it's not scarce anymore. Anyone sees the ponytail. Or take another example. I think Stefan Kinsella uses this. I'm not sure. You know, there are ways of making a log cabin. One, may, one way of making a log cabin is you just take the logs and you pile them up against each other, and the, uh, up on top of each other. And the problem is that they sort of roll off of each other because they're all round. So you put cement in there, and it's still sort of rickety. A better way of making a log cabin is you cut a notch in uh, like three feet away from the ends of all the logs, right? And then you fit them together crossways and now they're very, very sturdy and you hardly even need any cement to keep them together, although the cement would make the wall. Okay, so suppose I see 
a giant over there making a, a log cabin with uh, notches in the logs. And I say, whoa, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. And Jack, and Giant comes over to me with a gun, and he says, you do that, I'll shoot you. Unless you pay me for a, a fee. Because I own the right to that idea. Well, according to the libertarian view, as I see it, Giant would be in the wrong. Because I didn't steal anything from you. Now, if I took a log or two from his log pile, then yes, then he could come over to me with a gun and say, hey, block, you know, this isn't cool. Uh, give me back my logs. Because if you've got them, I don't have them. But he can't say, hey, block, stop notching your logs and making a better log cabin because if you do it, then my notches will disappear? Well, if they would disappear, if notches were limited in that way, then he would be in the right. But he's not. Okay, so now, see, the, the way I, I see it, there are two ways to answer this question. One is the deontological way or the rights-based way, which I've just done. And the other is the empirical or the pragmatic way. Will we have or will we not have more innovation if we have intellectual property or not? That was the way you started the question. Don't we need it in order to have R&D, research and development? And with empirical stuff, it, it's not as clear cut. I mean, libertarianism is a principle, right or wrong. You're wrong. Although there are continuum issues, but I'll get into that some other time. But on empirical stuff, it's it's hard to say. And now what you'd have to do is go to a a statistical analysis, which Austrians can do, but they wouldn't do it qua Austrian. They would just do it qua economists and say, well, here are you know 100 countries. These 50 had IP. These 50 didn't. And in other ways, they're the same. They have the same IQ, the same well. And look, here, this one or that one had more R&D. That would be one way to find out. The problem with that is you can't find 50 and 50 because every country has IP. They all have patents and copyright. So we can't resort to that sort of an empirical test. What we have to do instead is contemplate the following situation. Right now, half of the minds in R&D are trying to get patents for stuff that is useless but might become useful in the future. And whenever you invent something now, it's sort of like you have to go through an obstacle course. You can't just go and invent something. Because if you go and invent something, you're going to be stepping on other people's patents. So you have to go around all the patents, which takes more effort. And you have a lot of lawyers very intelligent lawyers, and then you have a lot of intelligent scientists and engineers, physicists, engineers, who could have been just inventing stuff and instead are giving expert testimonial stuff in court to define you know, who has a right to buttons or, or things like this, you know, where the pen goes in and out. So it's an empirical issue as to whether you'll have more R&D or not. But then Kinsella says, look, what's the optimal amount of R&D? Do we want to spend 100% of our GDP on R&D and starve? You get the point? I mean, if we spend all of our money on R&D, we'd have no food and we'd all die. That's a little silly. And what he says is the optimal amount of R&D is the amount of R&D that emanates when, when the law is, is just. And just law means no intellectual property. So that's the optimal amount of R&D. Now, it might be, possibly, that we get a little bit more if we protected property, although I think my judgment, my instinct is we'll get less because we're spending a lot of labor resources on fighting over these things and instead of inventing stuff. My, my assessment is we're getting less, but it might be that we're getting more. And then what Kinsella would say is we're getting too much. In other words, more R&D isn't necessarily good. Suppose that the optimal amount of R&D is 10% of the GDP, to just pick out a number. And that if we, if we have uh, property rights in, intellectual, in the intellectual arena, namely we have uh, copyright and patent, we'd have 12% of the GDP devoted to R&D. Well, 12% is wrong. We should have 10%. Because I'm stipulating that 10% is the amount that's compatible with no uh, intellectual property. Yes, young man in the back. Yellow. 
Okay, uh, so you know, Murray Rothbard wrote about two, two just wars, the 